Hey, Ben, you want to turn on your mic? Sorry about that. No problem. How are you? Doing good. How's the day been? It's been really good. I'm a little tired. Yeah. In fact, I'm very tired. I think meetings are, are more tiring by Zoom. Yeah, There's... they're much more tiring than, than they are in person. So, uh, but it is what it is. Yep. So how's your day been? It's been good. Um, yeah, I'm preparing to give group meeting on Wednesday, which I'm excited about. You're excited by it? Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I feel like I've been derelict in giving group meetings, which really isn't OK. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to make up for it on Wednesday. OK, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, so how do you want to handle questions? Actually, a question for you is, do you, do you have a preference? Do you, do you like people to interrupt in the middle or wait till the end? Um, so are you interrupters? Um, before the pandemic, we were. I think it's harder in Zoom, and I think probably not. OK. And, um, and I can't read chats while I'm talking. So if you keep track of what comes in in chat, that's good. If, if an especially good question comes up, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop you. But otherwise, I'll wait till the end. OK. And then um, how time sensitive are we? Um, not very. So I think, um, let's see, it might even officially, um, it might even officially go till 530. Okay, so if I go five minutes over, no harm. That's fine, yeah. Okay. Um, and what else? I don't know. I was hoping to, uh, well, now is not the time. Uh, have have more self-organized criticality to. Uh, yeah, I actually. But wanted it's not to the time. About some stuff that uh, that we had done, but um, again, you know, my pointer is not tracking my. I can see your pointer. I know, but my touchpad is being weird. Like right now, it's okay, but I think in some places it jumps. I could just jump there. Oh, yeah. It's not linear. Hmm. It's okay over here, but let's see over here. Yeah, misbehaving. Oh, that's beautiful art on a side note. Oh, that's my nephew. Huh. I write these pieces for eLife and he does pictures for them and I tend to use them. Hmm. Yeah, my pointer is just jumping. Hmm. Well, I have to give up on it. I might, the touchpad is what? probably just weird. Is this, is there a physical pencil that you're using on the touchpad or? It's my finger. I see. I'm on a surface. It's I have a, um, I have an iPad pencil and I find it very disappointing, but I guess. Hmm. It's okay over here. It's okay over here. It's okay over here. It's okay over here. You think it's a problem with the screen? The sensors, maybe? 
I think it's a problem with my touchpad, you know, the actual touchpad, I think. Yeah, it doesn't like being over there. So I don't know how you get that fixed. You probably don't. Right? Yeah. So I guess, I guess computers are not entirely made to be fixed these days. Uh, no, especially not the touchpad on a surface. It doesn't look particularly dirty. So I guess I could get a new keyboard for it. Right? That should solve it. Right? I mean, I can replace the keyboard on this because the keyboard just pops off. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should do that because it's not going to get better. Maybe I'll look into getting, we have another keyboard, but I think that one's in worse shape. I think the, the keyboard on my um, um, iPad is the only, the only part of it I'm entirely pleased with. Hmm. My husband has a new iPad that he loves, hmm. but he never had one before, so. then so when do they show up there are five of them i think i couldn't say because i'm never one of the first five hmm. i i'm guessing people will um will probably start a minute or two late but i i think that the big rush will come right at four is my guess Thanks, Ben, for organizing this, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. Long time no see. Hi, I'm, I'm a faculty in biophysics department. Thanks for making time to give the talk, yeah. Really oh, looking forward pleasure. to it. Or at least it was my pleasure before I did it. And I was telling Ben I'm a little tired now. Interestingly, you know, you'd think that not having to travel would make Zoom seminars with faculty talk, you know, meetings easier, but I think it's actually more tiring to uh, talk to people on Zoom and to be in their offices. I think students are having a Zoom fatigue because of all the lectures are online, all the seminars are online. So they are just getting tired of screen time, yeah. And there's something relaxing about a change of pace for a, for traveling, even if even if there's a lot of running around. That this doesn't feel the same if if you're at home. Yeah. Well. I've heard a theory that it's tiring because you. If you have your own face on the screen, you're spending all the time composing your features. And so there's an option to turn off your, the view of yourself. And that's supposed to help? Some people, evidently. I, I won't vouch for it, but. Well, that's interesting. Maybe I'll try and do that in the future. I seem to be turned off here right now. I'm only seeing one person at a time, which is interesting. Let's see. So what time do you usually start? I think I think we should probably give people another few minutes. Um, uh, 
Um, Hello. Let's say let's say four minutes. Give a little time for the stragglers. I've been amused. I've seen at least two Yale Zooms where uh, the hosts are paying for Grubhub to bring you food. To bring me food? Well, no, all the Zoom participants. Cool. Not just the speaker. Yeah. What about the speaker in an entirely different city? And <laughs> yeah, make, making us look bad. Never thought about that. Oh, one of yeah, them. Has, yeah. One of them was being paid for by the vendors. It was a vendor show trying to sell biologists cell plates and things. Well, they always show up with pizzas and stuff like that on campus. That's right. So this was in place of that. Yeah, it has started for some student events, but we haven't started it yet for physics uh, clubs or colloquia. The, the overhead to deliver two cookies and a cup of coffee would probably be too high. To um, everybody's house. It's very funny. It's a very funny idea. So I, I don't know, Ben, if you know this, but uh, so I'm at the West Campus EU, um, and I, we have institutes at the West Campus, so they have funds. So I graduated my first PhD student and we can use institute funds to get some food for the lab. So I, I use similar to GrabHub where at least my lab members will get some food when oh, my student nice. is present, presenting his thesis defense. So Ben is also at West Campus, so it's good for him to know, yeah. Yeah, I did not know about this. Huh. Um, may I interrupt? I just joined. I wanted to thank you again, Eve, for agreeing to come. And, uh, um, and, and thanks to you, Ben, for uh, making this happen. So thanks. My pleasure. Um, maybe we should get started. That's fine. You, uh, Keith, what do you think? Should we, should we wait a minute or two? Or do you think this is? They're dribbling in. It is in your hands, okay? Um, uh, okay. Let, I, I actually, yeah, I gave it a few minutes uh, uh, before starting. I didn't start exactly at four, so. Uh, yeah, it does look like there are still people arriving. It's slowing down. Yeah. So. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's get started. Um, it's it's really a pleasure to welcome and introduce Eve Martyr, um, a professor of biology at Brandeis. Um, so Eve's research focuses on how properties of of individual neurons and and neuronal components um, determine function in small and and kind of seemingly simple neural circuits. Um, and um, she's really unique in her field. Um, uh, and, and just, uh, I think what I find so inspiring about her work um, is that it's not quite, she, she's found out a lot of very interesting molecular details um, and also a lot of big pictures, but really it's the mapping between the molecular details and the big picture. Um, that's an area that, that to me, she's, she's really alone in, um, in investigating. Um, uh, I'm not the only one who's been inspired by her work. Um, she's a member of the National Academy, um, a recent recipient of the Copley Prize in Neuroscience, um, and, and we're very lucky to have her here. Uh, I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Well, um, so here's Eve. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation, and thanks to everybody for being here. And um, I must admit, this was a faster train ride than I usually have when I come down to Yale. Um, and I have a, a great sort of fondness for Yale because my, my younger sister got her PhD in the French department here. So I sort of feel like it's part family. Anyway, what I would like to do first as I start is 
No. Is um why is my advance not working? It just was working. Hmm. How did it stop working? There, okay. Um, I'd like to just show you my present lab and to thank them for being, uh, as I'm sure all of you have also been so brave in dealing with the last seven months. They've been quite heroic in uh, confronting the challenges of COVID. And I like to say I have four, four postdocs, I mean, six postdocs, um, a number of them are actually doing theory, two graduate students, uh, two senior technical staff and a number of undergraduates. Now this is my my sort of slide to show off with, and I. Eve, we cannot we cannot see your uh, your slide. You can't see my slides. No, we just see you. I can, I can see your slide. I, I can see it fine. I oh. can see him. So, Sorry. Okay, so it's, everybody, it's you. Well, I'm, so you should figure out why you can't see my slides. Yeah. So um, now, can you see them? Yes. Thanks. Uh, so I'd like to just um, tell you what I've done here. And for you many, many years, my lab has uh, combined experimental work um, with uh, a lot of model building and uh, the more theoretical work. And because I'm talking to a physics department, um, what I've done is I've actually put in red all the people who've come from physics, math, computer science, or engineering, who've gone through my lab and then gone on to other things. And you can see that the red is, is all over the place. And I really just want to um, pay homage to the beautiful work that all these people who were trained in, in math and physics most, most commonly have um, everything they've, they've done for helping us really make the neuroscience we'd otherwise do more quantitative and more rigorous and sometimes more insightful. And you can see my present lab um, I have this, ooh, zonal fish shouldn't be red here, but that's okay. Um, my present lab has a number of, uh, I have actually one, two, three, four postdocs who are doing primarily theory. And um, some of what I'll be talking to you about is what they're doing. Um, so, and I'd just like to make one more comment about this before I go on, and that is to say, um, a lot of people have left my lab and gone on to other things, including a number who are working in industry and government. There are people here who are now program officers at NIH and NSF, and then a large number of people have gone on to faculty positions. But I, you know, if I look at the contributions that these people have made to science, these people and these people and these who are still more junior, um, are making really extraordinary contributions. And I'm very proud of them. And then, of course, I have a large number of collaborators over the years, most notably Larry Abbott and his ex-students. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking to you about today is how is individual variability related to resistance to challenge. And I think about this as individual variability in humans, in the human population, and most particularly in today's world. Um, we all know that there's a terrible amount of uh, variability in um, resilience to COVID and all of its sequelae. And one of the things that people are really starting to try and understand is what is the basis of that um, differential resilience. But we're not going to be talking about COVID specifically, but instead the, the basic fundamental problems associated with trying to understand that. Um, now the the experimental preparation I'm going to be using um, to sort of set the stage for a number of these problems is the crustacean stomatogastric ganglion. The stomatogastric ganglion controls the rhythmic movements of the stomach of a lobster or crab. Now lobsters and crabs, are their stomachs are completely different from uh, human or mammalian guts. Um, the stomach of a lobster has about 40 pairs of striated muscles, and those contract when the motor neurons that innervate them fire action potentials. The stomatogastric ganglion in crabs, and all the data I'm showing you today will be in crabs, have 26 neurons, 
Um, most of these are motor neurons. And what we do when we make a preparation is we get animals. Um, these are wild caught animals. They're all adult animals and they're all male because the fishermen throw the females back into the water and they don't bring them in. So we buy them from a distributor on the harbor. Um, Brandeis is about 10 miles due west of Boston. And so the animals used to take a taxi from the fish distributor on the harbor to campus. Nowadays, one of my lab staff goes and gets them because other people aren't allowed on campus to make deliveries. So um, what we do is we take the, the animals, dissect the stomach out of the animal, and we dissect the stomatic gastric nervous system off the surface of the stomach and then pin it out in a silver lined Petri dish and then record either intracellularly with sharp microelectrodes from the somata or extracellularly from the nerves um, that contain now the axons that used to project to the muscles, which are long gone. Now, the important reason I'm bringing this up is that the neurons in the ganglion are unambiguously identified, un unambiguously identified um, according to their projection patterns in the periphery. So that means one of the reasons why this preparation has been so useful over the years is because we are literally recording from the same identified neurons in every individual animal. Now, the recordings that you get from the pyloric rhythm are shown here. Um, here are three simultaneous intracellular recordings, and you can see LP, PY, PD. LP is a constrictor um, for a valve at the back end of the stomach. PY is another constrictor for the valve at the back end of the stomach, and PD is a dilator for the, that same valve. So you have constrictor one, constrictor two, dilator, constrictor one, constrictor two, dilator. And this rhythm is ongoing in the animal at all times. And it's uh, useful to think of this as if it were your respiratory rhythm, which is also ongoing at all times. Your respiratory rhythm changes when you exercise or when you sleep. Likewise, this rhythm changes in its frequency and phase relationships according to the needs of the animal, but it maintains itself constantly. So these are what you see in the intracellular recordings. You see depolarizations, bursts of action potentials, hyperpolarizations, etc. In the extracellular recording over here, which now contains the axons of these three neurons, you see LP, PY, PD, LP, PY, PD. Now, for some reason, the time bar for the, on the slide has disappeared many years ago, and I keep forgetting to put it back. And the pyloric rhythm has a canonical period of about one second. So this is a repeating rhythm with a canonical period of about a second. Now, the early investigators who were attracted to this preparation wanted to understand how the nervous system could produce rhythmic um, motor patterns. And then they wanted to understand how those rhythmic pattern generators, how those rhythmic motor patterns were generated on the basis of the synaptic and cellular properties of the cells in the circuit. So here is what the goal of those early workers was, which was to establish a connectivity diagram or a wiring diagram. And here's what we see. There's a neuron, a single neuron called the AB. It's an interneuron and it's endogenously oscillatory. It's very strongly electrically coupled to the two PD neurons. Every animal has two PD neurons, one AB neuron. Now in all of my diagrams, electrical synapses will be shown as resistor symbols. These black filled connections denote chemical inhibitory synaptic interactions. And I think it's very, very important that you realize that all of the connectivity in the stomatogastric ganglion um, the chemical synapses are inhibitory. And the way this network works is you have a pacemaker kernel, these three cells, they burst together. You see that here. They then rhythmically inhibit the LP and the PY neurons. And the LP and the PY neurons fire on rebound from inhibition. And it's very, very important that in many parts of the, the vertebrate nervous system, neurons do fire on rebound from inhibition. And so rebound from inhibition can be a very important timing cue um, in brain and spinal cord circuits. Now, I'd just like to point out 
There are many instances in this circuit where we see reciprocal inhibition. LP inhibits PD, PD inhibits LP, LP inhibits PY, PY inhibits LP. We often call these half-center oscillators because this simple circuit was first described around 1906 by, um, by Brown, who was trying to understand what the structure of the nervous system could be to ensure alternation between flexors and extensors in cats as they walked across the floor. So, and we're gonna come back to studying a little bit about these half-center oscillators in a little bit. Now, just one other comment in passing. Um, this connectivity diagram would today be called a connectome. And as you probably realize, there's a great push now um, to try and get connectomes or at largely at the EM level or wiring diagrams for a lot of um, nervous systems. The first thing that should be apparent to you, if I had shown you this wiring diagram and not shown you these dynamics, there's absolutely no way you'd be able to go from this connectome to these dynamics. And that's because what's missing in this diagram are all of the voltage and time dependent currents and the strength and time course of all these synapses because you would need to know all those parameters before understanding how you could go from the properties of the components to the properties of the system. Now, without that information, this is just the first step. And so I always like to say this to the biology audiences to point out that getting the connectome for all of their circuits is just absolutely necessary and completely insufficient for understanding how a circuit actually works. And we've had this since 1980 and we're still learning how to go from here to here. Now, we spent a lot of time and I'll show you a little bit of that trying to characterize the properties of the cells and properties of synapses. And when you do, you realize that as you do more and more reductionist work to go after component properties, at some point you need a way of putting all that information back together again and evaluating the role of the components in system behavior. And that's why many, many years ago, probably almost 30 years ago, I started first collaborating with them and having um, computational and theoretical people in my lab, because the only way you can put all this information back together again and evaluate it is by building models. Okay, so I completely scrambled this talk. I've been giving a talk that worked really, really well, and I've given it a number of times, and I was a little bit bored with it. So not, not bored with the work, but just bored of the talk. So I completely did a major um, upheaval and I don't know if this talk is gonna work and if it's gonna make sense, but I decided to go through some case studies and understanding dynamics. Um, one at the level of single neurons, two um, looking a little bit at these two neuron reciprocally inhibitory half center oscillators, and then three, a last section on interacting oscillatory networks, the interactions in this case between a fast and slow oscillatory network. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be doing. And the first thing I wanted to do for those of you who are really still physicists and not biologists, um, I wanted to tell you uh, or describe to you what we usually do if we wanna build a semi-realistic model of one of these neurons. And so the classic steps in building a semi-realistic conductive space model of a neuron is first we do voltage clamp experiments, measurements of the ionic currents in the isolated neuron. So the trick is in a voltage clamp, you isolate the neuron um, and then you give steps in voltage and you use that and measure the currents that flow and then use that to try and characterize the effects of voltage and time on the opening and closing of each of the channels in the model. Those currents are then fit with Hodgkin-Huxley type equations. And those of you who know some neuroscience know the famous Hodgkin-Huxley equations. And these are just differential equations that describe the maximal conductance, which can be translated as the number of ion channels of that type and the activation and inactivation properties of each current. And then you would put all, all the currents that you've described, you'd assemble a model and then attempt to tune the model so it shows appropriate behavior. And these are just what some of those voltage, 
what those voltage clamp experiments might look like. Over here, we've got a current called the delayed rectifier. It's a potassium current. In membrane biophysics, outward currents are displayed up. So here are the voltage steps, and here are the currents that flow. And you can see this current turns on, and there's something wrong with my cursor, slowly, and then produces a sustained outward current. And now this is the normalized amplitude as a function of the membrane potential for this particular potassium current. Now, these are the voltage clamp measurements of a different potassium current. Again, they're outward but these show inactivation. That is to say the channel starts closing or no longer conducts, even though the cell is still depolarized. So here is what all of the, here's just a sort of schematic of all the models I'll be showing you. So these are all isopotential models. The lipid bilayer is the capacitance. Um, there is an inward sodium current. Sodium enters the cell, tends to depolarize it. There are two different inward calcium currents that differ in terms of their voltage and time dependence. There's a current called IH. And this is a hyperpolarization activated inward current. That is to say when the cell is strongly hyperpolarized, made more negative. This is an inward current that turns on. And it's very important in the recovery phase of neurons. And then there are three potassium currents. This is the delayed rectifier. This is the classic potassium current that's important for the deep, the hyperpolarization and the action potential that was first described um, by Hodgkin Huxley. And there's a calcium activated potassium current and an A current. This is a transient outward potassium current. So this model is very simplified compared to a real neuron, but nonetheless, it has, and then there's a leak current. It has these eight conductances. And what we do, we build these models, we specify the voltage and time dependence of the currents, and we specify the maximal conductance, which is effectively the number of each one of these currents in the membrane. And then this is all integrated. And so you have the usual membrane equation, CDV equals CDVDT equals, and then the sum of all, of all currents. And then this, this basic model will be what I'll be using throughout. Now, this next slide shows you a very recent um, development that allows us to visualize and see what the dynamics of all of these currents are during a change in membrane potential. So on the top, you see a bursting neuron. This is a neuron which is starting at minus 50 millivolts, and then it depolarizes on its own and fires a burst of action potentials, and then the burst turns off and continues. Now, this model, like the ones I showed you, like the diagram I showed you before, has all those same currents in it. And what you would like to see is you'd like to know what's going on with each of those currents as they open and close during these dynamics. And so Leandro Alonso, who's a postdoc in my lab, um, developed a way of visualizing that. And so, Remember I told you that we display outward currents going up and inward currents going down. We're keeping that convention. It's a convention, which I know physicists hate, but that's be as it may. So the total outward current is shown here in black during this burst. And notice this is a very compressed log scale. And now here we're seeing the contributions of each of the outward currents during the burst. So in purple, we're seeing the percent of the total outward current carried by the A current. That's one of the potassium currents. There you have purple. The calcium activated potassium current is shown in orange. And you can see here how it's changing over time during the burst. And then the yellow shows the delayed rectifier, which is the third of those potassium currents. And then the pink is the leak current. And then down here, we see the inward currents. The total inward current is shown down here. 
again on that log scale. The sodium current is shown here, then the two calcium currents, the H current, et cetera. So what this allows us to do is really see what's going on at every moment in time during the burst. And sadly, this is what I'd love to be able to do experimentally, but we don't have a way of seeing what's happening in real time to the opening and closing of channels um, experimentally. Maybe someday we'll be able to do the equivalent of this, but right now it's much more useful to do this experiment in a model. So now I'm gonna make the first sort of real scientific observation. And so what Leandro did is he generated um, using a series of genetic algorithms, he generated a large population of bursting models this is model A, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is six examples of bursting models with very similar behavior. But nonetheless, now that we have this way of visualization, we can see that in this model, the A current is very small and that in this model is bigger and down here in model F, the A current is enormous. Likewise, the calcium activated K current is much bigger over here in A. And you can see that if you just look at the outward currents and use your Gestalt viewer, your color visualization scheme, you can see that these currents in each one of these is very different, although the cells dynamics are very similar. So this tells you something that I think most physicists are very comfortable with, that you can find multiple models that can show similar behavior with different sets of parameters. And what, um, what I wanted to show you this before is that for biologists, the notion of these multiple solutions, um, when we first started talking about this in about 2004, 2005, many biologists were very comforted by this and many others were horrified. And the reason they were horrified, and we can come back to this later, is because if you were trying to understand the mechanism of burst generation, and you happen to be studying a neuron like this with a small A current, you'd say the A current was completely immaterial. It didn't contribute anything. On the other hand, if you happen to be studying this neuron, you'd say that the A current, the purple current, was very important. And so, this is telling you that it's not an easy match between the underlying um, conductances and the behavior of the neuron, and that you have these degenerate solutions. I'd like to make one more point, which is up here, we're actually seeing the maximal conductances. If we look at the A current, in A, the number of channels in the membrane is actually small and the current is small. In C, the number of channels in the membrane was large, but the current is only modest. And in F, the number of channels in the membrane is smaller than in C, but the current is actually much bigger. And that's because here we're plotting the, the percent contribution. And depending on what all of the currents in the cell are doing, you can see the A current is actually more important here than it is in here, even though the number of channels in the membrane is larger here than here. Okay, now um, on the basis of um, data like this or models like this, this raised a series of questions for us, which is how variable the parameters in real biological networks. And then do perturbations reveal cryptic animal to animal differences? And how reliably can animals with intrinsic variability respond to perturbations? and are some sets of parameters associated with higher resilience. And the, I have to credit my physics colleagues with suggesting um, the experiments about perturbations, because when we first started talking about this behavior, that they were multiple solutions, my physics friends said, yeah, they're fine. They're multiple solutions to producing the same static behavior, but different solutions are gonna produce you're going to see that reveal differently as you start doing perturbations. So we started doing that. Now, 
The answer to the first question, how much variability is there in biological systems? Um, I told you before, there's one LP neuron in each crab. So these are recordings from LP number one in crab one. This is the recording of LP in crab number two. You can see the waveform are very, very similar. And then when we do voltage clamp, and Jean-Marc Bayard did this, of now the calcium activated potassium current in LP number two and here in LP number one, you can see it's much bigger in two than in one. And then across, in this case, a small group of neurons, more recently, much, much larger, we see about a two to six fold range of values of the conductances measured in voltage clamp across animals. And at the same time, when Dave Schultz pulled out the single cells and measured mRNA copy numbers, you again see this two to six fold range across animals of some of the genes that are responsible for these, um, for these currents. And then if you look in, the, in later work, um, this is work that Dave Schultz and we've done together. And now we're looking at mRNA copy number in PD neurons um, for not just those um, currents I already showed you, but for a whole lot of currents, and this was done both in PCR and in single cell RNA-seq, and you can see for many of them, or for all of them actually, this two to six, two to eight fold range across cells, across animals in the same cell type. And I think it's very, very important that you keep this number in mind because this number is setting up sort of a, a space in, in a space in sort of solution space in which neurons can live and they can wander around in this sort of um, pattern. And then what turns out, and I probably won't have time to really talk about it, but probably is, is eventually the most important are the sets of correlations in the expression of these channel genes. And I should just say that the correlations that we see, and we see many of them, um, are different in different cell types. So one of the things that determines the kind of, uh, what kind of cell a, a cell is, is what kinds of correlations and expression we see. Okay, so just to summarize that, individual synaptic and intrinsic parameters can vary two to six fold across animals, even when they have very similar behavior. Now, I should say that this two to six fold variability pops up everywhere. It comes out of very beautiful work from Ron Kellerbees' lab in Leach. It pops up when you look at data from, from mouse, from rat, from any place where people have unpacked their data and done quality biophysics, you basically see the same number. And I think it's not, it's not an accident. I think this is a number that basically tells you about how well um, how well neurons can actually uh, self-tune. Um, neurons are really not capable of tuning any one parameter to 0.1%. And then if you start thinking about trying to build a system where the components vary way, way, way too much, you realize it will never work. And so I think this two to six fold is a really interesting sort of sweet spot in um, between what neurons can actually do and how well-tuned things have to be to have characteristic healthy behavior. Now, the other thing I'd like to say, and you sort of saw that, is that biological neurons have many different ion channels, including multiple potassium channels, calcium channels, et cetera, conductances. And then the question is, why so many? So it, it's not uncommon for a neuron to have five or six potassium channels, two, three, four, you know, calcium channels, two or three sodium channels. Um, and then the question is why so many? Now, when I say multiple cha potassium channels, these will be encoded by different genes and they will, in voltage clamp, when measured correctly, often have different voltage and time dependent properties. Um, and so then you, the real issue is why do you have so many within a single cell? Now, we'll come back to that. So stimulated by work that Astrid Prince did on the, on the, the network and just try and see <coughs> what would happen 
to crabs with different underlying sets of conductances, we wanted to say, could two animals with different sets of underlying conductances be nonetheless resilient to the perturbations that they have to encounter in their lives? So temperature, you know, is a global perturbation that influences all biological processes, but does differentially so that the relationships among processes will be altered. Now, obviously the effects of temperature will depend on the structure of the protein that you're looking at. And so since every type of protein will have a slightly different structure, it's very easy to imagine that the effects of temperature will be different on each of those. We've also studied the effects of pH, which also is a global perturbation that animals have to deal with. And we've studied the effects of high potassium. Now, before going on with the temperature, I would just like to say the crabs we work on come from the North Atlantic. They come right outside my door. Um, and they see temperatures as cold as two or three degrees centigrade in the winter. And they routinely see temperatures of 24, 25 degrees um, in the summer. And within a given day, they might see a 10 degree change in temperature according to tides and storms and where they are in the water column, etc. So these animals have to deal with, with temperature. Um, and then if that immediately, since you guys are really good at thinking about dynamical systems, you will be real, you'll realize that this becomes a problem. And that, this is just to remind you that the cute biologist calculate something we call a Q10, which just describes the effects of temperature on the um, biological process to be measured. And a Q10 of one is a process that's temperature invariant. A Q10 of two is one that shows um, about a doubling for a 10 degree change in, in centigrade. A Q10 of three is obviously much more temperature dependent. And I should just tell you here that most processes involved in neural signaling, um, the Q10s as measured for either the conductance of an ion channel or the activation and inactivation, that is to say the opening and closing of the rates of opening and closing of ion channels, the Q10s are usually between two and four and a half or two and five, um, but they're all different and they all have to be measured individually. That said, there also are very interesting channels with Q10s that might be 10 or 20 or 50. And those are the, the ion channels that are important for sensing temperature that animals use to basically um, find temperature gradients. And those, those channels are highly specialized and have very, very, very high Q10s or apparent Q10s. Okay, so now, I'm, I said that having all the Q10s in a neuron immediately causes a problem. And this is the problem. Um, so most sets of conductance densities that give rise to similar behavior at one temperature will not be temperature compensated because temperature changes the activation and inactivation rates of channels differently. So if you think about a bursting neuron and here, this is a model that Tim O'Leary built a number of years ago just to show this point. We have three versions of the model it's shown at a reference temperature of 10 degrees in the middle. This is a beautiful bursting neuron. It's firing a burst of action potentials. And then what Tim did is he implemented a different set of Q10s in three different versions of the model. And now we can see what happens as you change temperature, if you either go warmer or colder. As you go warmer, each of these neurons behaves differently. And it behaves differently because those different sets of Q10s will change the opening and closing, the sequence of opening and closing of the ion channels differently. So the middle neuron actually maintains its activity fairly well as you increase in temperature. However, the top neuron goes from being a bursting neuron to being a single spike burster until it goes into a depolarization block. The bottom neuron, when you warm it up, goes a little faster and then it stops bursting and starts firing single action potentials until it stops firing into hyperpolarized 
membrane potential. And notice the bottom neuron becomes a single spike burster in the cold, very similar to the behavior of this neuron in the warm. So this is the problem. If you had crabs and all of their neurons were so temperature sensitive because the Q10s were not properly matched, it would be really hard to imagine that the animal would be able to deal with temperature in a really good way. But then, so let's ask, how well do the, the crabs deal with temperature? And now these are recordings that Lamont Tang um, did in probably 2008 or 2009. And now we're looking at extracellular recordings from the motor nerves. And this is PD, LP, PY. PD, LP, PY at seven degrees. And now in the same preparation at 19 degrees, you can see PD, LP, PY, PD, LP, PY. So the first thing you see is that the frequency has gone up as you would expect. And the second thing you'll see is that the relative um, organization or the phase relationships of the turning on and turning off of the units has been maintained. And that's shown here in this plot where Lamont has plotted the mean phase of the cycle for each of the neurons. PD turns on at zero and then it turns off and then LP turns on and then LP turns off, PY turns on and then PY turns off as a function of temperature. And you'll notice in this experiment that phase is perfectly temperature compensated. And when Lamont brought these data into my lab, I, my mouth dropped open because the notion that the relative timing was perfectly maintained, despite the fact that the frequency was changing, starts, so you start thinking about all the different processes that have to be matched to allow this to happen. And if you think about motor systems, where what's important is that you maintain the relative timing of activation of all the neurons in the oscillator. While the frequency is able to change, you realize that this is really extremely what has to happen. And then the same thing is just seen here in intracellular recordings that Lamont did at 7, 11, 15, 19, 23 degrees. Again, you can see the beautiful, the rhythm is increasing in frequency, but Lamont here overlaid, he took out time and overlaid the 7, 11, and 19 degree um, recordings. And you can see they're superimposable, which tells you that the Q10s of all the processes had to be perfectly balanced in some interesting way to ensure that the membrane potential dynamics are maintained. And I should say that the Q10s of the process we've all measured are all different but they're all in that range of the two to four fold range. Okay, so, however, every animal we've studied in, at temperatures between seven and 23 or 24 has done this. They've been remarkably good. However, early on, Lamont discovered that if he now went to much higher temperatures, to extreme temperatures, then he started seeing what he called crashes. This is animal one, animal two, this is a different animal, this is a different animal. And each one of them is showing disordered rhythms or partially crashed rhythms. And the way they're crashed is different. And this is exactly what you'd expect on the basis of the fact that every one of these networks has different sets of conductances for each of the cells in the network and for the synapses. So this set of parameters and this set of parameters and that set of parameters and that set of parameters, they were all fine um, in the range, in the, in the good range of behavior, but then you're seeing crashes and differential crashes. Um, now, when we started seeing this, we immediately assumed this was because of the different underlying parameters, but we also were curious to see what that pacemaker kernel, that bursting neuron would do when isolated from the rest of the network. And so Tolly Rinberg, who was an undergraduate, a physics um, undergraduate in the lab 
who then went on to do many things, including go to graduate school at Stanford and Harvard, and God knows what he's doing now. Um, he, he did intracellular recordings from the, the, the PD neuron after removing all the other inputs from the other cells in the network. And now you're looking at those waveforms as a function of temperature. And then this cell was perfectly fine up to 27, whereas this cell was crashed by the time he got to 27 degrees. And if you look over here in the pool data, you can see that all of the neurons behave very similarly at low temperature, but as he got higher, warmer and warmer, you can see these curves start coming apart. And there were 12 animals in the population here, and five of those had crashed by the time he got up to the highest temperatures, which were probably 27 degrees. So you can see that divergence of behavior at the more extreme perturbations and the resilience down at the bottom of the temperature curve. And now these are just um, another way of showing the same thing. Um, here we've got recordings from, actually I think these are the two PD neurons in the same animal. Um, and in this experiment, it looks like Lamont started warm and then he decreased temperature. And you can see he started out with two crash neurons and as he decreased the temperature, you can see the rhythms came back. And then in this, he started out cold. And then you can see here as he increased temperature, the neurons stopped firing and it lost amplitude and stopped firing. And then this is a recording at warm temperature that shows the genesis of a whole bunch of unusual, slow, long, um, weird rhythms with fast and slow rhythms superimposed. So this all goes to the different kinds of behaviors that you can see at high temperatures as those currents get out of, um, out of whack with each other. Now, to get more insight into what was going on, Leandro built um, temperature compensated rhythms. Again, he used a genetic algorithm to find, to find um, solutions that were good at 10, good at 15, good at 20, good 25, and crashed at 30 degrees. And he did that by asking for the phase maintenance, for the frequency to increase, and he also was looking for solutions that actually showed um, phase compensation, phase maintenance. And now what he did, and so each, he did this a number of times and found a whole bunch of different models with different Q10s for all of the Q10s and conductance densities. And so like the biological data I showed you before, these are five models with different parameter sets. They were all fine up to 25 degrees, but as, as you go up to 30 degrees or 28 degrees, you can see they're all crashing differently as exactly as you'd expect. Um, so A, B, C, D, E, those are five different models with different sets of um, parameters. And this is at a slow time base on the left and at a faster expanded time base on the right. And you can see these variety of different dynamics that arise because of the specifics of the underlying solution. And the, one of the things that's very nice to be able to do in a model that again, we can't do biologically is here you see one model at 10 degrees and then at 25 degrees. Leandro has plotted the, the sodium current and at 10 it's small, at 25 it's big. In another model, the sodium current is big at 10 degrees and gets smaller at 25 degrees. And here you have one of the calcium currents is big at 10 degrees, it gets smaller at 25 degrees. And here you can see it gets a little bit bigger. So these models are all perfectly good, well-behaved in terms of their underlying um, behavior, but the mechanisms by which they're doing that are completely different. And now I'm going to show you my most favorite slide of 2020. 
because I think this slide makes a really important point. So I've been showing you Leandro's um, models that are bursting perfectly well from 10 to 25 degrees. And now what he's doing is he's showing you the last spike in a burst. And you can see that. And he's showing you that at 10, 11, 12, all the way up to 25 degrees. And again, we're using this way of visualizing what's going on. So the total outward current is shown up here in black, but I want you to look just at the other outward currents. At 10 degrees, you can see the A current, the purple is very big. And as we go more and more, as we go up to 25 degrees, you can see the contribution of the A current to the total outward current has become very small. In contrast, if we look at the calcium activated K in orange, you can see it starts out small and then smoothly gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go up to 25 degrees. Likewise, the delayed rectifier, which is in yellow, started out big and then gets preferentially smaller as you go um, higher in temperature. The reason why I love this slide is because it makes the very important point that the overlap, it doesn't actually, the overlap in the voltage and time dependence of these potassium currents allows them to transition from a burst and spike repolarization mechanism at 10 degrees, which is very dominated by the A current and to a lesser degree by the, cal by the delayed rectifier, and then to smoothly transition in mechanism to one where the calcium activated potassium current in orange is doing most of the work. And so to my mind, this raises the possibility that the reason you have so many different potassium currents or calcium currents in cells with these overlapping voltage and time dependencies is that allows you to basically tile in voltage and time and smoothly move from reliance on one current to reliance on a different one so that you can expand the dynamic range over which these cells can, can respond. Now, that I think is, is a really interesting idea. The problem for the experimentalists, for the reductionist experimentalists is, again, if you were to ask the question, what current is most responsible for, for spike and burst repolarization? If you happen to be studying it under these conditions, you'd get a totally different answer than you happen to be studying it under these conditions. And so I think it's very important that people understand that the expanding the dynamic range means that you don't end up with a single answer to what the role of the given current in dynamics is. Okay, so the conclusions from these crashes are that at low temperatures, all networks are well behaved, showing consistent changes in frequency and outstanding temperature compensation. And each individual animal crashes with individual dynamics as predicted by their underlying parameter differences. And I didn't show you this, but I will tell you that some neuromodulators may expand the stable range of temperatures while others make the preparations more temperature sensitive. Now, I would like to move on quickly, I hope, for just to a consideration of a similar set of ideas with two cell, these half center oscillators. So in these experiments, what Katja Marzova has been doing is she's been using a method called the dynamic clamp to construct artificial circuits from biological neurons. So she's recording from two GM neurons. These are real biological neurons. And then she has a model for the synapse from one to the other sitting in the computer. And she also has a model of the H conductance, that's a hyperpolarization activating with current sitting in the computer. And then she records from the two cells. And then when she turns on the dynamic clamp, she basically is asking the dynamic clamp to inject through an electrode in the cell, the current that would flow through the model conductance at the membrane potential that she's recording. So she can create this artificial synapse by recording the follower cell. The computer knows what the reversal potential is and what the properties of the currents are. And then it, it injects that current. And as the voltage changes, then the current will also change. So here we have two silent cells. When Katja turns on the H current and the synapses, she creates a half center oscillator with alternations between these two neurons. 
Okay, and so this is an example of a circuit which requires, it depends on this hyperpolarization activating inward current to depolarize the cell, bring it to threshold, and then when the cell comes to threshold, it releases transmitter in the model transmitter that hyperpolarizes this cell. This cell eventually um, crosses threshold and turns on, and that turns this one off. So in these circuits, the thing that one has to understand is what gives rise to the transition points between the on and off cells. And in general, there are two kinds of mechanisms. There's a release and an escape mechanism. In the escape mechanism, the inhibited cell depolarizes above its synaptic threshold, and therefore it terminates the, act, the action of the active cell. In the release mode, the, the depolarized cell falls below its synaptic threshold and allows the other cell to, re to rebound from inhibition. So we have these two very different mechanisms that can cause a half center. And in Koch's experiments, she can control what she's doing by where she sets the synaptic threshold. That is to say, the membrane potential at which she says the cells will release transmitters. So here, if it's set at minus 52, whenever the cell is above minus 52, it's releasing artificial transmitter. And then when it falls below this threshold, it no longer does so. And that's true of the other one. And here, the synaptic threshold is much more depolarized. Here, it's at minus, minus 32. And so when the cell falls below its synaptic threshold, then that sets the chain in motion to release the other cell. OK, so why am I showing you this? I'm showing you this because um, the two kinds of networks respond or show very different behavior as a function of parameters. So in the escape mode, and you can see that here, as you change the values of these conductances, you can see the frequency more or less is maintained. And so that's shown on this diagonal. Whereas in the release mode, as you change the values of those conductances, you can see the frequency has changed a lot. And that's shown over here. Now, this is why I'm showing you this. Escape oscillators, the pure escape oscillators are relatively temperature resistant. And so here, what Koch has done is she's created, in the blue, you see the threshold for transmitter release, this beautiful alternating half center. And now she's done a temperature ramp and she's changed temperature here. And you can see that this oscillator is almost completely temperature resistant. And this is just a spectrogram of that. However, in the release mode, the half center is much less robust temperature. So here you just have these two cells. And here's a change in temperature. And you can see the half center starts breaking down. And here she's just blown up this transition. And you can see that as the temperature is increasing, the amplitude of the oscillators, and eventually the whole thing just breaks down. And then when she cools it again, you can see the oscillator reforms. And then um, this is just a very pretty little example that shows that half centers with higher values of GCN and GH are more robust to temperature. So here we have um, a half center with relatively low levels of GSIN and GH. And now in response to a temperature change, we're losing the robust alternation. And then what she did is she actually just increases them here. And then the same thing, but here, yeah. And then here she starts out with higher levels and then higher levels. And you can see this oscillator is much more resistant to temperature than this one. And then I'm just gonna show you one more slide and say that you can have oscillators sitting in a mixed, in a mixed mechanism. This is an example here 
of an oscillator, a beautiful half center, which is in what we call sort of a mixed intrinsic and synaptic escape. And then in response to changes in temperature, you can see that the oscillator moves in its relationship to its synaptic release threshold. So over here, it's now in synaptic release whereas here it was more or less an escape mode. And the reason I like this is it tells you that the, in response to temperature, the circuit is entirely changing its mechanism of action. And this is again, very important as we think about the effects of all kinds of perturbations, et cetera. So temperature can gradually transition circuits from one mode of activity to another, and in so doing, alter their mechanism of action and their sensitivity to other parameters. Now, I have a, um, I had one little additional segment I wanted to talk to you about, but I can stop here. Um, it's questions if you want five more minutes or not. Somebody say something out loud. Ben, should I keep going or should I stop? Yes. What? Yes, I think so, yeah. You're going? Okay. So I'd like to tell you this other little story, which is another one of my favorite stories. Notice I'm taking all these wonderful physics people. Um, this is work that Gabrielle Gutierrez did, and she started out in physics and applied math. And, and um, okay, so I was talking to you before about the pyloric rhythm, LPPYPD. It's on a fast time scale. I mean, this is a fast rhythm. There's a second rhythm called the gastric mill rhythm. And you can see that here. Here's LG. And it's firing in bursts, but these are much slower than what you see here for the pyloric rhythm. And LG alternates with DG. Let's see here. And GM fires with LG. Now, the, what I want you to look at are these two neurons, IC and DD. They fire in time with the pyloric rhythm. And we, they were always considered part of the pyloric rhythm. However, they fire in envelopes of activity in time with the gastric mill rhythm. And when Gabrielle looked at that, she said, oh, and we've always known that IC and VD can switch between being part of the fast oscillator or being part of the slow oscillator. And here is now the connectome for the whole stomatogastric nervous system, not nervous system ganglion. And notice here, we have PD and LP. Notice that reciprocal inhibition, the half center over here, this is part of the fast rhythm. And then notice over here, there's LG and N1, and that's a half center. That's part of the slow rhythm, the gastric rhythm. Um, and Gabrielle noticed, being a physicist originally, she noticed that there was a, a symmetry in this five cell circuit where in and around one makes a monosynaptic connection with IC and it makes a polysynaptic connection through LG and this electrical synapse. Likewise, PD makes a monosynaptic connection with IC and then a polysynaptic connection through LP. And IC is one of those neurons that does these switches. So Gabrielle framed the question. She wanted to know what was controlling the, the soul of the oscillator. So she said there's a war between the fast oscillator and the slow oscillator for the soul of this hub neuron. So she decided to build that circuit and she decided not to build this circuit literally, but to use it to really build the five cell circuit um, in more general terms. And so she chose um, Morris Lacar models with, with an added H current. They have a calcium current, a potassium current, and an H current and a leak. And she chose she labeled two cells, F1 and F2. Those are fast oscillator one, fast oscillator two. HN is the hub neuron. And notice she started that out with a medium frequency by itself. And then we have S2 and S1. These are two slow oscillators. And she coupled S1 and S2 and reciprocal inhibition. And here you see the alternation of that half center by itself. She coupled F1 and F2. And here you can see the alternation of that half center. And then if she just coupled up that central electrical coupling, the cell synchronized just as you would expect. Okay, so now she wanted to put it all together. And here is her putting it all together. In the next few slides, she's called the strength of the electrical coupling, GL. That's the electrical coupling conductance. 
and G sin B is the strength of these synapses, and G sin A is the strength of these synapses. Now, the really cool thing that Gabrielle did is she came up with a really good visualization tool. So we've got five concentric circles and squares with the outside circle being the frequency of F1, then F2, the square is the frequency of the HN cell, and the middle ones are the frequencies of S1 and S2. And now this is on a heat map, so this is fast, medium, and slow. Okay, so one set of parameters. You can see HN is firing with the slow oscillator. So F1 and S2 are firing in alternation quickly, and HN now is firing with the slow oscillator. And that's visualized here as two orange and three blue. Here, a different set of parameters. Notice all five neurons are firing at the same frequency, and it's an intermediate frequency, and that's why all of these are, are, are green. Okay, so here's what Gabrielle called the parameter scape. What you see on the X is the, the conductance of G sin A, and what you see on the Y is the conductance of the electrical synapse where every point is illustrated like this. And now you can see the whole map of what's going on as a function of the strength of these connects. So up here, you've got a big region, region D, where you have one fast and, and four slow neurons. Right next to it, you transition into a region where you have four fast and one slow oscillator. Here in green, all the cells are going at the same frequency. Down here and over here, you have all these different regions. And so um, you can actually see with, a, with, with, again, with a moment's eye where the boundaries between these regions are. Now, the reason why I love this is, first of all, it's beautiful. And Gabrielle made me a blouse of this and she made me masks for COVID of this pattern, but I also love it for another reason. If you imagine now a neuromodulator which changes the value of G sin A. If you start over here and you have a small change in G sin, in G sin A, you can transition across basically three different circuit qualitative circuit behaviors. On the other hand, if you start over here, then a change in, the, in modulator A that's much, much larger won't change the behavior of the circuit qualitatively. So this for biologists is a really important, important um, slide because it shows you that you can't immediately extrapolate, I'm sure you guys all know this, how, how important for the circuit behavior or for the transitions in circuit behavior, a change in one of the parameters will be depends entirely on where in the state space you start. So here a small change can produce a dramatic qualitative change in behavior, here a large change produces very little change in behavior. Okay, I have just two more slides, two more, and then I'll be done. So this is again, one of my favorite slides. Here's Gabrielle's circuit, and this is her control, HN is firing in the slow. And then she takes and decreases the amplitude of GCNA, and she flips HN from slow to fast. So then she does a different manipulation, and she decreases the strength of the electrical synapse and she flips HN from slow to fast. And then she does still a third manipulation and she decreases the strength of these synapses and she flips HN from slow to fast. The reason I love this is because we have three entirely different mechanisms that can produce a very similar change in behavior. And I like it because all the people who are working in flies and worms and mouse who are trying to understand the role of a given perturbation on circuit dynamics, they almost always would do one of these, but not all three of them. And the reason there are three of these mechanisms existing is because of the parallel pathways or the multiple routes by which cells can interact with each other. And I always make a joke about this and say the poor graduate student there at Yale does this experiment and thinks, and they actually get a paper in Nature because of it. And they say, now I've shown the importance of G sin A 
for the behavior of HN. And then the graduate student in Bangalore does this and says, God, that guy at Yale doesn't know what he's doing. This is the answer. And then some poor person in Taiwan does this experiment and says those other guys are completely nuts. And they're all right. And they all are only seeing a part of the answer. Now, if this can happen in a five cell network, imagine what it hap what's going to happen in the large parallel pathways in complicated networks in the brain. Now, just one more slide from Gabrielle's work. In everything she did before, she was just changing the strength of the synapses. But she said now she wanted to look at the effects of modulating the HN neurons dynamics. So she's taking her HN neuron and she's changing its parameters to keep the frequency constant but the waveform differently. And then she embeds it into two networks. In one network, there's a strong connection from F1 to HN. And the other one, there's a weak connection from F1 to HN, but a strong electrical synapse. So let's look at this one. She embeds this neuron, this neuron, this neuron into this network. And here, HN changes its behavior because it's being modulated. But the other neurons in the network are basically completely unaffected. And so the network itself is basically almost completely unchanged because of the modulation of the hub neuron itself. However, if you start out with this set of parameters, and now when Gabrielle embeds this into these models, into this network, here you've got two yellow and three blue. You've got three orange and two blue. You've got green. Everybody's starting firing at the same frequency. And when she puts this version of the model in, notice one of the slow oscillators has completely stopped firing and it's gone silent and the others have all gone um, faster than they were to begin with. So in this case, modulating the hub neuron has that the effects of that have percolated through the entire network. Whereas in this case, the effects of modulation of the hub neuron have remained completely local. And for those of us who worry about modulation and network dynamics, this is a really important result because we need to know how local or global the effects of modulators are. And I'll just stop and say differential resilience in the population is a necessary feature that comes from the inherent degeneracy or multiple solutions to producing similar behavior in healthy nervous systems. Some mechanisms for differential resilience are automatic um, and arise from the properties of ion channels, receptors, and signaling. And I didn't talk about this, but some mechanisms for resilience will depend on homeostatic mechanisms, behavioral adaptation, and learning. And then individuals with similar starting circuit performance with relatively similar circuit mechanisms in the control state can nonetheless show entirely different crash mechanisms. And this is a cautionary tale for thinking about disease. And I'm very sorry to have gone long. Thank you. Thank you. Uh oh, I've frozen. Everybody's frozen. Uh, maybe I'm back. Uh, you're back. We here. Awesome. Now, now it looks like everyone's back. Um, thank you very much. Um, Let's see, I think for questions, um, feel free to type into the group chat or, or just shout something out. Um, um, I'll start actually. Um, so you, you mentioned that, that part of the reason why there are so many seemingly degenerate ion channels is, is, is that this helps, um, I guess, this makes the, fun the system more robust. Um, is this enough? So, so we have, I don't know, thousands of different GABA channels that all roughly um, open to chloride ions when GABA's around. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess maybe this is a, a slightly ill-posed question, but... No, you don't have, th you have thousands of GABA activated chloride channels. Most of them are identical. And then you may have three or four different classes of them 
that are different, right? So you don't have thousands of non-identical GABA channels. You would have 10,000 of one and 2,000 of another and 3,000 of a third. Okay. So Maxwell, well. In the Maxwell conductance, there's a number which is basically equivalent of how many channels of the same cell type. So uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so you showed us uh, this beautiful slide where you had the, um, you showed as a function of temperature, the fraction of the current that go through one channel or the other is changing, no? And that enabled the system to maintain its rhythm, um, you know, robustly across all those different temperature. Mm -hmm. Then when you go beyond certain temperature, some neurons start to crash but they crash differently. And I am assuming that the reason they crash differently now is because of cell to cell variability in the expression level of those different channels and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so one question is what would happen if you take those crabs and you put one in a tank that is of you know 12 degree plus minus two degree for like a, you know, a, you know, a couple of days and another one at a higher temperature and so on. Okay, so we- Would you expect to see all the crabs that are in the same tank to now have similar level of expression of the channels or still not? No, there are two answers there. First of all, when you acclimate animals by putting them at different temperatures for long periods of time, you basically have to do it for three weeks or so. What you can do is you can actually shift the crash point. Okay? okay. So what happens, what happens if you take animals and you acclimate some at seven degrees, some at 11 and some at 19 degrees, they all behave very similarly at the bottom end of the temperature range, but at the top end where they start crashing, the ones that have been acclimated more at 19 will go further before they start to crash. So you basically just shift the crash point. And we've seen this happen in life because when the water is very warm in the ocean, we see the crash points shift um, naturally. Okay, but in all cases, you still have different sets of, you still have the two to six fold. You may have, a, the two to six fold doesn't change. So you don't, constrict the variability, but you may be on a different part of the manifold. There's this, this multi-conductance manifold floating through, and you may be on a different place on the manifold, but you still have that two to six fold variation. Hmm. So why two to six, not three to seven or one well, three to four? Three to seven and two to six are the same number, <laughs> right? I mean, that's not a, um, I think I think basically on the bottom end is a limit to how precisely any biological process can take place. Remember, ion channels are turning over in the membrane. So these crabs are five to seven years old, and they're replacing every single ion channel many, many times during their life. Um, and they have to be able to replace them in a way to maintain their function. Um, so I think it's just too hard to be constantly swapping parts. You have to do with everything has to be controlled to the 0.1% level. So I think the two to six fold is consistent with allowing for the stochastic replacement of all the components of the cell. But it's, a, so it's large enough for biology to be able to accomplish and it's restricted enough to stay in a space we can actually still get a solution to the target activity pattern. But so do I, you, it's can I just follow up with a, with a question for that? So do you think that, that that two to four fold is also what sets the range of temperature over which those neurons can, the multiple animal can uh, basically be robust? or a single animal, what, what sets the range of temperature that a single animal can adapt before crashing lower or higher? It's probably the, the, the specific set of conductances in that animal 
at that moment. Now, if I go to an animal um, in year one and I go a year later and in my thought experiment, I could do it, it's not gonna have exactly the same sets of conductances because it will have wandered around in conductive space. It will still probably have that two to six fold whatever range, but it won't be in the same place in conductive space. So um, I don't know exactly what sets that crash point, but that crash point is also sensitive to adaptation. So, and it's all, so it's, so call it life history in the ocean for five years is doing, leaving some sort of long-term trace. Um, and then you can see that in the particular sets of conductances that are there and their correlations and whatever. So, and that's the, it's so hard about asking, asking the, that final question I originally posed, which is so hard, which is to say, how do you find the, what defines the, the differential resilience, right? In other words, you can show that animals are differentially resilient, and we know that, and you can also find a lot of these other things, but to really say, can you find a causal relationship between this, this, and this, and resilience becomes very difficult. And that's what the human genetics people are trying to do with COVID, right? They're looking through all the human databases and trying to say, if you have this gene, this gene, and this gene, and this gene, you get mild disease. And if you have this gene, this gene, you have this gene, you get severe disease. And they're looking, but they're looking, I mean, they have an advantage, which is they have giant data sets and disadvantages that they're just they're looking for random correlations. I mean, sometimes they're looking with reason, but I think that's the really hard problem. Can I ask a, a, another question? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the talk, Professor. That was uh, great. Um, so I'm also thinking about the sort of uh, smooth change of the different uh, ion channel fluxes as you change temperature. Um, and uh, so uh, the system, from my understanding, is uh, high dimensional and very nonlinear. Right? You have all these different, uh, right. you have all these different um, conductances and, and stuff like that. And that, to me, uh, it feels like it would be very hard to find a smooth changing of parameters in that space to produce the same outcome. So. You know, if you if in your model of all these different conductances, if you were to just take a smooth but sort of random trajectory through it, how easy is it to find sort of a uh, path along which you get the same sort of behavior? Something I didn't tell you something. I didn't tell you, um, and that's because I scrambled everything up. Okay, um, it turns out if you if you randomly search in parameter space it's really hard to find good temperature compensated cells or networks. Mm. Leandro had to work very hard to find them. And John Kaplan, who was a graduate student years ago, had to work very hard to find ones. So if you just search in parameter space, you don't find them. I mean, mm -hmm. the crabs always, always find them. So the question is, how are they finding them reliably? And Tim O'Leary built um, a new version of a, a homeostatic model. And what he showed is these homeostatic models generate these beautiful correlations in channel expression. And once you find the right set of correlations, you immediately can find the neurons and networks that can do temperature compensation. So basically, if you set up certain obligatory sets of correlations, instead of wandering hitherwise through <laughs> random conductance space, you're following on some well-defined manifold, which is taking you through this preferred path. Now, it's not a straight line. Mm -hmm. right? You're still going to be wandering around, but it's but there clearly must be some sort of ribbon through uh, probably a pretty narrow ribbon. <laughs> random parameter space, but if you stay on that rhythm, rhythm ribbon, you probably can be in that, in that path. So okay. these are rare, 
Mm -hmm. random space and every crab finds it. Since every crab finds it, well, the ones that didn't find it are dead. <laughs> no, I don't know how many dead ones, I, but I suspect that that's not why they're dead. Um, um, but I think that, you know, you, if you imagine that you genetically specify the co-regulation of some of the ion channels so that you maintain those important relationships. Um, and then the Q10, so in, in random space, we randomly varied the Q10s. And so you figure some of the Q10s will be fixed. And then, um, you know, those correlations allow you to traffic through. Amazing, thank you. So I also uh, had a question oh yeah, regarding, ahead. sorry. Yeah, that was very interesting talking to you. Um, yeah, so uh, regarding that fractional change uh, that happens and you change the temperature, I'm, I'm wondering what determines the ion channel that takes over to compensate for the one that has like less current. So uh, my hypothesis is that um, presumably the, these different ion channels have different uh, stability in terms of the, the energy landscape when you change the temperature. So is the, the, the ion channel that takes over, is that the one that gets more stable uh, at, at the temperature that's, that's uh, changing? Probably is not. that what determines the... No, it's probably, it's probably simpler than that. I don't think at those temperatures, I don't think, I don't think the temper, the, the crashes that we're seeing are not, are not occurring because the proteins are becoming unstable. What they're occurring because the dynamics of the relationships between the activation and activation, the timing, it's getting out of whack. Okay, so you can imagine if you take it up to 50 degrees, all the proteins will become unstable, right? The, everything will become denatured. That kind of crash, I would call a cook. Okay, but all of the crashes I showed you are reversible. And so mm -hmm. these crashes are coming because, you know, the, the activation of the potassium current is coming too soon for the sodium current. So for example, if the potassium current speeds up more than the sodium current speeds up, then the potassium current will turn on before the sodium current has had time to generate an action potential. So you won't get an action potential. So that's all a dynamical systems process, not um, a, a temperature sort of destabilization at that point. Okay. Thank you for, and um, I have a second question, which is unrelated. So you sh is, it, uh, is it possible that a number of the ion channels is kind of related to uh, the temperature range that the animal experiences in its environment? So like, could you do an, an epidemiological study where if you look at animals that have in very small temperature changes in the ecosystem, then you would expect they need less uh, adaptability, so they will have less number of ion channels. Uh, in principle, you could do that, but I suspect that animals that have very that are very stable in temperature, nonetheless, have to deal with three or four or five other environmental issues. Mm. So, for example, they may have to deal with changes in pH, or changes in salinity, or changes in oxygen tension, or changes in this and changes in that. So the other thing we didn't really talk about is the extent to which resilience to one perturbation either um, is associated with resilience to something else. So the, we've done these experiments with dual perturbations with pH and temperature because we wanted to know whether there was a trade-off between resilience to pH and resilience to temperature. And it doesn't seem like there's a hard trade-off um, but it also doesn't seem that in an animal that's good with one is necessarily good with the other. It turns out the, the changes in activity that happen with temperature are orthogonal to the dynamics that you see mm. with the pH. Mm. So I would say in principle, yeah, there's something there, but you would also need, if you really want to ask, what does the animal have to be resilient to? And it's really, really important because crabs out there in the wild have to be resilient to temperature, to changes in oxygen, to changes in um, CO2, to 
change in the salinity, change the pH. And those are not necessarily completely independent, but a lot of them are sort of vaguely independent. And then we have to worry about environmental pollutants, humans and the seagulls, right? So I think unless you really know all the perturbations or all the, that the animal has to deal with in its natural environment, it's hard to know where the trade-offs are like. Thank you. So can I ask you another question? Um, in, in, in bacterial chemotaxis, it has been shown, so the same kind of problem has been studied, the dependency of the robustness of the response uh, with temperature. And it was shown, uh, we know where the correlation between the level of expression of different enzyme and receptors and so on uh, comes from. It comes from the architecture of the regulatory network and the arrangement of genes on, in, in operon on the genome. And also via a secondary uh, structure in mRNA uh, structure that herp in loops and things like that that are temperature dependent and control the translation efficiency of those those genes. And so I was wondering if in if anything about you know, similar things are known for your system. Do you do you know are there structure in the way the regulatory network that control the expression of those genes? Uh, uh, is wired, or can you yeah. look in that to find out why they're correlated in one way? We, we know what some of the correlations look like, but we don't know anything about what the regulatory networks look like. So I'm going to imagine that whatever bacteria figured out to do this, that most of those lessons will have been maintained. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just it's just too hard a problem to throw away the knowledge that the bacteria figured out, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I don't think that you would, so I'm not saying it's gonna be identical, but I'm sure the strategy that they mm -hmm. have is probably gonna be maintained. Yeah. Interesting. You guys must be tired. You guys tired? It's okay. It was a great talk. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Well, it was a great pleasure. And I had fun talking with you guys today. And um, and Terry, is there a view article about the, the gene regulatory networks and temperature and bacteria that I should look at? Yeah, actually, I wrote a news and views about it. Okay. And then I'll send you some paper. And me. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's thank Eve again. Well, thank you guys. And I'm going to go and make dinner for my husband. Thank you so much. Thank you for being so here, being home. Thank you. You still have to make dinner. Yes. <laughs> there, you would feed me dinner. Exactly. You would take me to some restaurant. Yeah. yeah. We <laughs> okay. would, for sure. I know you would. So nice to see you guys all and um, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.